Good evening, everyone. This is Pastor Sean. So think about the church is the body of Christ and the head of the church is Jesus Christ himself. It's a wonderful picture. The body of believers come together, became a body and then head, the head of church is Christ. But can you imagine that there's a wonderful body, but there is no head? It's not a beautiful picture. It is a scary beast, right? So here is a message for this church in Tyathira, where, where Christ is saying that you need to have the church, the head of the church. Tonight, our elder Scott Thayer will be presenting the message based on this message to the church in Tyathira. So please, please come closer and let's have this wonderful time together to listen to the word of our elder Scott Thayer. Good evening, Southview. Tonight, we're continuing our series of the week of prayer, talking about the messages of the seven churches in Revelation. This week, we're gonna be talking about the message of the church in Thyatira. The messages that we are covering are messages that were relevant to those churches in their time, to, with their various sizes, with their unique situations and circumstances, with the reputations that they had. The messages, they have themes, and these are themes that you're starting to see emerge. Themes such as calls to attention, rebukes, calls to action, and talking about the rewards and the consequences of whether you follow or whether you fall away. It's in this context that we're going to be looking a little bit deeper at the church in Thyatira. And with that, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you for giving us your word that we are able to open it up and read for ourselves and learn the message that you have given to us in our time today. Please be with us as we open scripture, as we study, as we contemplate, help the words to touch our hearts and draw us closer to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Before we begin and open up the word, there are a few things about the church in Thyatira that are important to cover. One is that the church in Thyatira um, the ancient church is in present day Turkey in the city of Akazar. And the church in Thyatira is the smallest and least prominent of the seven cities that are mentioned. It was really a small town in kind of a tucked away part of Turkey, Asia Minor. And so it's a little bit interesting that it's included at all in the message to the seven churches. Some people have theorized that this, these seven churches were part of a mail route and so John was writing a letter that would get passed around while the mail carrier went from city to city. However, that's quite unlikely just based on how the roads were set up in that day. So it's probably not a geographic mail route that's um, bringing the cities into being spoken to. Little in the Bible is known about Thyatira other than this mention in Revelation. The only thing that we have is that Lydia, the purple seller, was from Thyatira. So it really is a small and relatively insignificant town. One thing that was taking place though that we know is that there were mandatory trade guilds. So if you were a laborer trying to work, you had to join these guilds, sort of equivalent to a union today, but it was much more so then. Part of what was going on with these guilds is that they would be worshiping and they would be making sacrifices to the gods of those particular trades. There was a lot of drunkenness and drinking that was taking place and there was various types of debauchery that would happen. There were temple prostitutes and there were sexually immoral things that were happening as part of this. It really put Christians in a difficult situation because you had to stay true to God, but if you wanted to work, you had to join these guilds. So it was a very difficult and pressing situation. So with that as a background, let's open up and read the story the message the church in Thyatira. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, and we'll be reading beginning with verse 18. Revelation 2, verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose feet are like blazing fire, and whose feet... <clears throat> To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like a blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. 
I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead, then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. With these verses fresh in our mind, let's examine in a little more detail some of what we've read. First, and this is a little bit of... Um, uh, repetition for those that have been listening and paying attention. The book of Revelation is a book of apocalyptic prophecy. You know, it's a little bit different than classical prophecy, which was dealing with things that would happen in the days to come in relatively cl clear language. Apocalyptic prophecy is dealing with end times, and often it's very full of symbolism. And we'll see that we see this a lot in Revelation. Also, within Revelation and within these messages, there are three specific periods of time that are spoken about. This message was delivered to the very real church in Thyatira at approximately the same time that John was alive and, and writing this in the, around 90 AD. So this was to the people then. It also pertains, as we know through studying scripture, to a historical period. You know, we believe that these seven churches, as time has transpired, we can look back and we believe that each of these churches pertains to a specific period of time throughout history. And the church in Thyatira, that historical period that it corresponds to is in the Middle Ages. And many Adventists, many of you listening now, probably understand that we believe that the, the last message, the seventh message to the church in Laodicea that Tim will be speaking about on Sabbath, that we believe that that corresponds to our time today. But don't tune us out just because we're talking about Thyatira, because that third time is specific to us, to our lives here today. So as to the church in Thyatira then, it represents the historical period around the Middle Ages, but it's also got direct relevance to us in our situation today. As we start to look at some of the symbolism in the verses, we see a number of things start to come to our attention. As we see in verse 18 of Revelation chapter 2, there's the rep there is the mention of the angel, to the angel of the church in Thyatira. Now often we think of angels as the created beings that are God's messengers, but more broadly speaking, angels can refer to people in God's service. And so what this is speaking to is it's the leaders in the church in Thyatira. It says the angel of the church, but it's talking to the leaders about the leaders. Also in verse 18, we see eyes like flame mentioned. This is Jesus talking about himself. And here he's talking about his penetrating ability to see into the innermost part of one's being. That's being able to see in, to see the heart, to see the motives, to see the intentions. Also in verse 18, we see feet like fine brass being referenced. And for those of us that have spent time in scripture, when you talk about feet and brass and materials, you immediately start thinking about the vision, the, the dream rather, that Nebuchadnezzar had found in the book of Daniel chapter two. Turn with me as we take a look at what we see in Daniel chapter two. Reading from Verse 31, this is Daniel chapter two, verse 31. Your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver. 
its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. Jumping down to verse 41, still in Daniel chapter two. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it. Even as you saw iron mixed with clay, as the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. So as Daniel was interpreting the dream of the iron mixed with clay, he was giving a message of instability, of weakness, and ultimately something that would collapse. But here in Revelation, what we see is this fine brass, pure brass being spoken to. This is speaking of an uncompromising stance, the ability to stand true despite seductive influences being around. It's a direct contrast to what we saw in Daniel chapter two. In verse 20, we see Jezebel spoken of. Now this isn't the Jezebel that existed in the Old Testament. This is Jezebel, a person that was a real person in Thyatira, likely not actually named Jezebel, but represented by the name Jezebel. And this was a person who was corrupting the influence or the church rather with their influence. This Jezebel symbolizes the corrupter. And we also see sexual immorality referenced in verse 20 as what Jezebel was leading the believers into. And there were sexual activities that were taking place, but more than sexual activity, we understand through the Old Testament and through other parts of scripture that sexual immorality stood for spiritual adultery, impure things, impure religion being promoted, worshiping gods, mixing the false with the true. This is what that sexual immorality is speaking to. In verse 23, we see Jezebel's children referenced. And her children here are not biological children, but they're her followers. They're people that take on this thought, that pursue the same types of things, that bring about that same type of corruption. In verse 23, we also see Jesus speaking of searching hearts and minds. And that's speaking to the core of getting into someone's thoughts and emotions. They might act one way, they might do something, but this is the ability to see in and really understand what's going on inside someone. And in verse 26, the reward promised is being a ruler over the nations. And if you think about Thyatira, they were a small, relatively insignificant town. To be promised rulership over other nations? This is sort of like Thyatira's own beatitude. You know, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Thyatira, if you stand strong, blessed are you. You will be made ruler over the nations, even though you're small and insignificant today. And lastly, in verse 28, we see the morning star referenced. The morning star, from an astronomical standpoint, is Venus. It's that planet in the sky. You know, behind the sun and behind the moon, Venus is the brightest thing in the sky. And that's why they called it the morning star, because it was the first star that you would see in the evening as the sun started to set. It was also the last star that would remain bright as the sun um, was rising. And so this brightest, this first, this last, it's a direct representation of Jesus, the morning star. It's another one of his names. It's another one of his attributes. Now that we have a better handle on some of the context and the words being used, let's reread this passage in Revelation to the church in Thyatira, except adapted to our time and our place, speaking to us here and today. To the leaders of the Southview Church write, these are the words of the Son of God who is able to see into your innermost thoughts and motives and who is able to stand without compromise. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first, that your ministry is expanding, that your membership is growing, and the spirit of revival is in the air. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate the ones that call themselves righteous and yet are not. By their teaching, they mislead your God-fearing members into spiritual corruption 
and distract them with false gods. I have given those corruptors time to repent of their wicked ways, but they are unwilling. So I will cast the corruptors out and will make your members who listen to and follow them suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways. I will strike all of those that become corrupted dead. Then all of the righteous churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Southview, to you who do not hold to the false teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations that one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give that one the morning star. I will give that one Jesus. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to Southview and the churches. It sounds a little bit different when it's directed directly at us, doesn't it? In its simplest form, what we've just read is saying that Southview is growing and appears successful, but we face a corrupting influence. And that corrupting influence is from the inside, and that's something we have to watch for because we're told that some, yes, maybe many will remain fast, but we're also warned that some will fall away. And the reward for those that hold fast is immeasurable. It's Jesus, it's life eternal. What an amazing thing. But the destruction for those that fall away will be permanent and it will be absolute. This is really a which side are you on, one or the other. This is a call to attention. You know, it's easy for us to believe in and embrace the loving God of the Bible. However, with just as much conviction, we must also believe that Satan is real and that he seeks our destruction. When we think about this, we often expect the roaring lion prowling about seeking who he may destroy. Or maybe we expect the dragon waging war against the woman and her offspring. Maybe we anticipate this will show up in our lives as an attack on our Sabbath beliefs. Are you gonna work on the Sabbath? Are you going to join worship on Sunday? Or maybe it could be a direct being asked or forced to renounce our faith. We would never do that. But what about when the devil shows up as the behind the scenes manipulator, as he did in the book of Job, when he shows up at the heavenly council and says to God, God, Job only follows you because life's good for him. How about I change that and let's see what happens. When the devil shows up like that, for us today, it might be a cancer diagnosis out of the blue that cuts short a promising life for no apparent reason. It could be a career cut off in its prime, completely unexpected. These are the types of things that the devil is actively doing. But what about it? What about when he shows up? What about when the father of the lie shows up? as the one sharing hidden secrets, such as he did in, in the garden when he was talking with Eve about the things that God was hiding from her. Maybe this is the new person that shows up in your life that starts talking with you and they're into religion and they wanna share the secrets in the Bible that they've found you that other religions aren't bold enough to proclaim. Or how about it's that Bible scholar? Just think about how the devil showed up and tempted Jesus he had Bible verses and they were on point. They were out of context, but they were scripture. It could be that someone shows up today with their verses to try and convince us that we are in error. Maybe the state of the dead we have wrong. What about the saints blood calling out? Well, the saints are still there, right? Maybe not. Or how about having those key verses, those proof texts, that show the contradictions in the Bible. This verse directly goes against that verse, trying to shake our faith. What about that Bible scholar? Or how about the time that the person is telling you what you wanna hear, such as the televangelist that says, if you donate to me, you're gonna get back so many times more what you give in. What about that prosperity gospel message? Parts of scripture look like that, but it really isn't the whole thing. 
Or how about the know-it-all that Paul warns us about in his closing words in the book of 1 Timothy? Let's turn with me now to the book of 1 Timothy. And we'll take a look at what Paul warned us against. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, Paul writes, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing have departed from the faith. Maybe today that's showing up when people are looking around and they're seeing the immense nature of the galaxy and its age, and they're looking at the fossil record and evolution and using all of that to explain away God because it's knowledge, it's proof, it's there. What about that? These are these corruptions. These are the persuasions of the devil that we have to be aware of and we have to avoid. Our adversary, the father of the lie, is actively seeking to destroy us, but he's sneaky. He knows the best way isn't a direct assault from the outside. We're too smart for that. We're too strong for that. He knows the best way to get in and to get us off of the truth is subtly and from within. And that's the message that the church in Thyatira was warned against. It was a corrupting influence from the inside. Because of this, we have to be aware. We have to look out. We need to listen to indicators that there's a problem. You know, is there a sick feeling in your stomach? Do you have this nagging feeling that something isn't quite right? What you're hearing doesn't mesh with what you've been told? Maybe your conscience is giving you a hard time if you're being asked to do things or think about things differently. It's not that we don't want to always be looking for the present truth because we know that our understanding is always growing and advancing. But what about those things that take us away from what's truly scripturally based? The best protection from a corrupting influence is to be inseparably bound to the truth. You know, David knew what he was talking about when he wrote Psalm 119. Turn with me there. Psalm 119. Beginning with verse 9. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. David knew that the best protection against stumbling and going astray was to hide God's word in our heart. God's word to us is scripture. This is a call for us to spend time in scripture to protect against evil influences and perverting and twisting influences. David knew what he was talking about. But also, there's safety in numbers. We need to surround ourselves with other believers. It's more than just a good potluck on the first Sabbath of the month that we have downstairs. This is Christian fellowship. It's affirmation. It's encouragement. And in some cases, it's correction. We see this idea of safety in numbers on display in the wild. If you take a look at how elephants protect their young against lions, they'll sur the adults will surround the young and the lions can't get in because there is strength in numbers. Similarly, when we come together as a church, it's difficult for any one of us to get singled out and picked off if we have the fellowship, if we have that nurturing influence all around us. And for those of us that believe, that read the word, that follow along online, but aren't actively engaged in church, this is a warning. This is something to pay attention to. There is value and benefit in being an active part of a fellowship and a congregational body. So if you haven't found a church to join yet, find one. It will enhance your religious experience. If you're part of Southview and you haven't been here for a while, we'd love to see you back. Now's the time to return. There is a lot of benefit to being involved actually in the church itself. The message to Thyatira is clear. Be on alert. There's danger lurking. And that danger is from within. Identify it. Call it what it is. Reject it. And hold fast to the truth. The reward for those that do the reward for those that hold fast to the truth is that they will be made ruler over nations. For those that hold fast to the truth, they will be given the morning star. And that morning star is Jesus.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the message that you've given to the church in Thyatira. While you wrote it specifically to them, it's directly applicable to us today. Thank you that we have the Bible, that we're able to read for ourselves, that we can open up the word, we can study it, we can scour the truth that you've given us so we can understand what is real and what isn't. Thank you, Father, for the community that we have in believers, that we can come together, that we can worship. And in doing so, we can correct each other if we happen to stray, and that we can reinforce those that are on the right path. Father, please be with each and every person that's listening to this message. Please touch their hearts in a way that resonates with them, that points them to the truth, that connects them to that, and connects them in a way that they will not stumble when that cor corrupting influence ex exerts itself in their life, that they will be able to identify it and stand firm in the truth. Father, thank you for all that you've done. Please continue to bless us. Please continue to pull us closer to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Elder Scott Thayer, for your wonderful message today. What a wonderful blessing it is for us to hear one more time about, about this special, special message to the church in Thyatira. As we've been doing this, this wake up prayer, I want you to pray, especially this moment, if you can, have, if you can do that, pray for our church ministry. We have so many ministries going right now, from children to adult and different days here, and including Safia Christian School. That all our ministry, all our ministry must be rooted into Christ and hopefully we can grow with His Spirit. So please pray for our church ministries, whatever we're doing. I hope that we're doing according to the will of God. Tomorrow, tomorrow we have a very special message lined up. Our elder, Mike Duran, will be presenting message based on the message to the church in Sardis. So please come back tomorrow at seven o'clock. And then like we've been doing the sermon and the message will be streamed uh, through our Facebook page and YouTube channel. So I will see you tomorrow at seven o'clock with the message to the churches in Sardis.